Welcome to the ultimate behind the scenes Bassmaster Classic breakdown show. And we have the one individual that had a closer seat to everything that happened with Jason Christie this week than anybody in the planet. This week, an extended Jake's take with Jake LaTondres, Bassmaster camera guy. On. <laughs> I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome, friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. Happy hump day to all my humpers. And man, what a Bassmaster classic that was. And Jake's take, the 20 minute segment that just grew, it just made the longest podcast that we've ever had. So I'm not going to talk very much because this show. We have my buddy Jake Latondres, and me and him are just going to talk about the classic. And think about this. Jake was Jason Christie's camera person for day one, day two, and day three of the Bassmaster Classic. There's no other human being on earth that saw more go down, and he's going to dish all. And I'll throw in a few little Bassmaster Classic behind-the-scenes nuggets, and um, this is a long one. So um, pack a lunch or break it in two parts. But I hope you enjoy the ultimate Bassmaster Classic Jake's Take. Jake, this is going to be the greatest Jake take ever. <laughs> or Jake's Take, I guess. Uh, what a wow. freaking week. Wow. Dude, do you, are you exhausted or are you just like jacked? Yeah. No, exhausted. I'm jacked, but I'm exhausted. Like afterwards, it's always, I always find it shocking that like the whole way through it, I'm I don't like get sore or anything, but then the next day I wake up and I'm like, ah, oh, I got hit by the classic train, <laughs> but I didn't get sick this year, which was nice. Um, because a lot of years at the classic is pretty tough to avoid getting sick. Um, but it was, I mean, honestly, probably one of the best classics ever. Like I don't I care about the attendance numbers, you know, that's a huge number and everything, but I just mean from the experience from uh, I mean, what more could you ask out of a bass tournament? I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, I, you know, I'm just a camera guy, and my phone has been blowing up since, really since we came off the water. I actually started, you know, that on day three, on Sunday, my phone just started blowing up. And I was like, dude, y'all can't bother me right now. <laughs> like, it was, because it was hit and run, hit and run, hit and run there the last three hours of the day, you know, it, it was it was intense. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it um and I think you guys are so synonymous with each other. Let's be good at this show, first of all. Jake fished with the Bassmaster. Nobody on earth in the entirety of Earth, I don't know if you thought about this, had a better view of exactly how Jason Christie won the Bassmaster Classic, not just the final day. Every single day you fished with him, or, or I say fished, but shot him. Um Day one and never left his side in one of the coolest moments of the entire classic. You post on your Insta stories or your Instagram. And uh, dude, I saw that happen from the stage, but it was so cool because he's holding the trophy and, you know, he's knuckling people. And then he sees you, you guys see each other and he puts the trophy down and you have, you know, it was just like redemption for both of you. It was really cool to see. It, it was, it was, I, I just got goosebumps as you were kind of telling that story because Jason Christie's not a hugger, you know, no. he, he's not, he's not, he's just not that guy. And when he, I went up there prepared to give him a high five and I had to ask the security to let me out of the media gates <sighs> to go up to the boat because they didn't, you know, they didn't know who I was. And I had, I told them, I said, man, I begged them. I said, look, I was Jason's camera guy, uh, for three straight days. And I just want to go give him a high five. So I had my big, I had my camera, my big lens in my left hand. And I went up there prepared to give him a high five thinking that's what it was going to yeah. be. And dude, he put his trophy down and I almost, I almost lost it. It was cool. It was cool. It was, um, and, and I was really happy because when you're on the stage, you see different things. Like there's a lot of things I see that other people don't see. Right. But I really love that victory lap we do um because it's literally me up on the stage and i just get a chance to watch it like absorb what's going on and you see all these different interactions like i saw him pass the guys from express and i knew how much exactly. it meant to them and stuff but 
watching you you guys hug was uh, was really really cool. So let's let's go backwards. Okay. Um, <laughs> we went straight to the end. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's your show. Ends. Thanks for watching, people. <laughs> he gets a trophy. He gets a hug, and it's uh, over. Yeah. Um, but what, what was? Day, I mean, you you and Jason were going to be together in day one, and and I thought that was cool because you guys had that kind of bond. But there also had to be some weird freaking pressure with that. No, when I got my like when you, I got the. When I got my assignment, I got my assignment on Thursday afternoon. Re actually, we got our assignments like Monday. And when I saw, I knew that they were, I knew they were going to put me with Christy. I didn't know, but I knew they would because yeah. of what happened four years ago. And everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people that were close to the show or close to Bass, you know, knew what had happened. Yeah. And because I had to hold that camera in his face on the truck ride back to the arena, I became a part of that, you know, emotionally. Um, and so when I got my assignment, I knew at that point, and you know, Dave, like the first, the first Jake's take segment we did the very first time we started this, you asked me who I, who I got, who I had my money on yeah. at, for the classic. And I said, Jason Christie, hands down because of all this stuff that happened. So I was extremely pumped. Um, I was nervous because you know, that, that unlucky, you can be the unlucky cameraman a lot quicker than you can become the lucky camera guy. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. Like if it was five ounces different, this would be a whole different show. You probably never, Never be in Jason Christie's boat again. I was either going to be, be the hero or the zero. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So, you know, I, I was nervous, um, not nervous, but anxious. Yeah. And I really wanted this to happen. And now all of a sudden, you know, I'm doubling down on my bet because I'm going, okay, now I want, and now I really want him to win because I don't want to be a part of that. What happened in 2018 again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So how do you think, how do you think he felt going into day one? Like, what was what was your vibe? He was totally chill. And and who said it? So I think I read the article on Bassmaster.com, uh, you know, about his win and how, or maybe I just read it this morning in Bassmaster Magazine. I can't remember, but I read something about him where someone said, one of the other anglers was quoted as saying, you know, he's been, oh, J.O. said it, and it was in uh, the latest issue of Bassmaster because they were talking about, you know, they were previewing the, the classic and Lake Hartwell's yeah. history and all that. And there was a quote in there from uh, James Overstreet that said, you know, Christy, he's been there and done that. His experience is what would get someone like him through this tournament yeah. without any distractions of, of the classic. And there's all these new guys that have only fished one or two, maybe yeah. three classics, you know, uh, that are really, still really. partying at the classic. That's the way there was two different groups of like, I found not just Jason, but you had, uh, and sorry to cut you off. Cause That's you know okay. how I am, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you had guys like Christy hackney swindle, Cruz, there was a bunch of those guys that I felt a different vibe from. And not to say that one of the partiers couldn't have won, but there is a total different situation. Like, I feel like the time away for some of those guys really, they, they, they actually, not just did they learn themselves, but I think they, they watched the classic and, and they weren't part of it. So they watched the ups and downs that you go through and the like swindle to have focused more offshore than most people would, would say, and it didn't work out for him. So people will say whatever, that's an incredibly mature approach. You know what I mean? Like in the past, you would expect Gerald swindle to be beaten the docks and, it, but it felt like there was definitely guys that were at a different place at this classic. Like it was, it was, and I, like I said, Somebody who partied could have won, um, but they didn't. Um, so anyways, I mean, I, I think, I think even, you know, elaborating on what you're saying, um, 
some of these guys that left and came back, they just have a new appreciation. They've, they've, they've had to look inside yeah. themselves and they've rejuvenated their careers by thinking, okay, this is a restart button and I'm going to be different. I'm going to be more relaxed. I'm going to just go fishing. I'm going to do things my way. Yeah. I'm not going to let the pressure of, you know, someone tell me, well, this is what we should be doing or conventional wisdom isn't going to control me like it does when, when you're young. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think I think that's I think that's part of it. So Christy was chill. I mean, he I walked down to the dock. I mean, I, I sat up there, you know, I'm thinking, OK, here we go again. Another Bassmaster Classic and it. All of us that are a part of it, even the fans, it is such a big deal to be at the Bassmaster Classic. I mean, it is it's truly a spectacle, right? Is it not? Oh, yeah. And it, it um, I mean, that's why I call it the greatest spectacle in sport fishing, because it's not just bass. There's nothing in the world. I don't care about bajillion dollar tuna tournaments. Nowhere has the spectacle. And that first morning, dude, I found that emotional for me, for a lot of anglers. And I'm, I don't, I think you guys might even be, might've been on vet in the venue before kind of the crowd. You guys get there a bit before yeah. people, um, but coming in that day and just like, literally I'm on the highway and I'm driving, it's a 40 minute drive or whatever from Greensville, Greensville, um, and dude, every car for a mile in front of me turned off uh, at the exact same <laughs> exit. And then every car made that left. And you're like, everybody is going to the classic. And a lot of the anglers talked to me and they're like, it was nuts because every car that passed me on the road was honking. And they were like, is something wrong with my, it was, they were all headed there. Like it was, so to see all those thousands of people that showed up. And I, I mean, I openly saw Scott Martin well up like a lot of people were very emotional because it was like that never i mean it we get we get giant crowds and but it never ceases to amaze you like it is such a it's an emotional weird thing and i i mean maybe it i is. overthink it but i felt it did you oh dude i i mean just trying to get to the entrance yeah. the entryway of of the boat ramp the walkway down to the boat ramp it's like it's like you're walking through, it's like Mardi Gras or something, you know? <laughs> and then when you get to the walkway and you walk down, you're like, you almost feel important because there's all these thousands of people, you know, standing up there wanting to, wishing they were you that where you could walk down to the boat ramp or the, the dock and interact with these anglers. Yeah. So you walk down, I've got my camera, my, my, my dry bag. Because all my hard stuff. To in, just to interrupt you again, just for most people to know, hardly anyone gets on the dock. Like exactly. we're talking about and like too much. I think I, I heard that Roland Martin got turned around going on the dock, which is ridiculous. Roland Martin wow. should be able to defecate on the dock if he said wants to, but um, he should have put a Tennessee hat on and said, Hey man, I'm Bill dance, <laughs> <laughs> but they, they don't let family down there even. And, and I get it because we have had those docks get so overrun and we've had people fall in and stuff. So it is a safety and I get it, but Roland Martin would have been, would have been safe. So anyways, yeah. hardly anyone gets on the dock. Hardly anyone gets to see what you're seeing. Right. So you walk down and then you turn around and you look up at what's going on up there. And, and it's like, it's like a football stadium or, you know, it's an arena full of people and it's this huge event. And that's when it really hits you as to how big this actually is and what this means to those anglers, because they're sitting in their boats you know, some some person, someone like Jason Christie, he's seen it before. Yeah. But he's, you know, no matter how chill he looks, he's still nervous because oh. he still has that that the whole history that's now behind him. But he's still going into day one thinking this is like Hartwell. You know, what am I going to do different? Or or I'm just going to go fishing. I'm I'm constantly trying to block this out of my head. So. I get to the, to, I walk up and down. I, I went and hugged all my buddies that are fishing yeah. and I put my Great. camera now down. Now everybody listening to this that you didn't hug will be knowing that like <laughs> you're not their buddy. I pretty much or hugged yeah. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just went and wished everyone good luck and, and safety and all that good stuff. I came back and um, Jason's, uh, I guess now fiance, Shan was yeah. sitting in the boat with him and I was about to step on the boat, but before I put my weight on the on the front of the boat, I said, I said, well, Jason, it looks like it's me and you again. And he was facing the other direction, rigging some jigs on a rod. And he didn't even turn around. He goes, man, I wouldn't have this any other way. 
And as nice. soon as he said that, I felt like all the pressure or gone. it was gone because it was, there was no wall barrier between me and Jason. It was, it was game, it yeah. was game, game time, you know? So that was a really cool, that was a cool yeah. start to the, to the beginning. One of the coolest things about those, the, the takeoff talk, which is, was weird. Green pond landing is the best in the world. I don't care what, where, I mean, but it's giant. So those crowds, like you imagine you put that in Knoxville where it's all piled on top of each other. I, you could see how much bigger that crowd even was than Knoxville, which Knoxville was nuts and will be nuts next year. But one of the coolest things about the dock that I found was I spent most of my time up top, you know, when I was on the microphone, because we couldn't, there's so many cell phones and stuff. You have to be pretty close to the source at the classic or it all gets screwed up. So <clears throat> I wasn't walking around the dock other than casually, but the cool thing, but the dock was it's kind of removed from all the pandemonium. So it was actually like the calmest part. It was like this weird, we were in like this snow globe <laughs> when you were on the exactly. dock. Where exactly. You could talk. You didn't have to yell. Uh, a a snow was, globe is a really, really good analogy because that's what you felt like. And you felt protected. Like you're in this big bubble. Yeah. You know? Like, but, and even but, on the water, there was hundreds of boats, like just exactly. like hundreds of them literally waiting to follow these guys, but they weren't, they weren't close to you there. And it, 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 it was drones. It was How many drones oh. were flying oh. around? <laughs> <laughs> you know, One there was a crash on day looked, three. Was there? There was a drone crash right at takeoff, literally like right after the national anthem, two drones collided. One hit, one went like, like sputtered down into the lake and the other one hit the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, did you see that not to go in another direction? Did you see uh, Betty Benjamin Oliver is an incredible drone pilot. Oh, did you oh. see what he did? He flew through my legs during I and did. That was shot during like, it's easy to shoot that when the place is empty, <clears throat> but it wouldn't have been near as cool a shot, but we did that. And, um, it, it was, was such an incredible. I, I love that clip. He did. He 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 pulled off some really incredible yeah. shots. You know, when he flew under the flag before takeoff, down around the boat to back up to the crowd. I mean that 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 that's a game changer from a visual yeah. standpoint. Those were cool, man. On the practice day, true story. People want to see behind the scenes. I love Benny. I mean, me and Ben, we worked on a bunch of open tees videos together. Like he was, we were. He's one of my buddies, right? You bet. So I hate that he doesn't work for Bass full time anymore, but he comes back at the odd event. So I hate not working with him, but we are always working on stuff. And as soon as I saw him, I was excited to have him there, but he was flying on the practice day. And I mean, I know how professional he is, but I just went past him and I like tickled his belly. I'm like, Hey, Benny, you're a professional, right? And then afterwards he comes out and he's like, don't ever do that again. Cause he wears like the full goggles. To yeah. The fly, FPV so we can't see anything. Goggles. Right. And he showed me this clip. There is a clip where he literally like almost takes out Hackney's head. Hackney just kind of looks up as. <laughs> <laughs> so was that tickle. when you bumped him in the belly button? One hundred percent. Yeah, he said. Here's where he, uh, he said I can hear your voice here, and you see the drone. <laughs> and then I tickled him. Um, but um, uh, sorry, Benny, and I'm glad you didn't hit Greg Hackney. Okay, so day one on the water. I mean. I feel like there's not a lot of pressure on day one of the classic. There is like leaving. There's an emotional, but once you get out there, you're like, if I don't catch him today, there is zero pressure. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so Christy had two patterns going, right? He had a deep yeah. drainage pattern going where he had these big balls of, of greenback herring, you know, in this long drainage and it was, he was catching him in 30 feet of water on a, on a, with, with, with a spinning rig. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and so we pull in there and he's really just trying to keep, first he wants to keep the gallery of boats. There were 17 or 18 boats that followed him out of takeoff into this little spot, which was literally the first cut under, after you pass the bridge from takeoff, it was, it was literally a, a three minute boat ride to his first spot. Right. Yeah. So it's all calm in there. And he goes in there. He's the first boat in the only boat in there. And he starts catching them. 
right? And and he tells me, he says, look, man, my goal here is to fish through this deep water and try to catch one or two good ones. Yeah. And 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 maybe catch a limit and then leave here and go hit the boat docks to try to cull the other three or four fish, whatever it is I had. And that's the reason I'm telling you that is because that comes full circle back to day three. So when we get to day three, we'll come back to this scenario. Okay. It's really important. Well, those um, keeping score would probably be about four hours from now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he, he catches, as I recall, he caught like, you know, maybe a four and three quarter, a five pounder and a four pounder. So he met his goal. Yeah. And then it started to slow down. Um, and, and that was all about, you know, his live scope. That whole, that whole scenario was all about his live scope, keeping people, the fans out of his, out of the drainage. So they yeah. weren't spooking the fish cause they were suspended and, and all that stuff. So he met his goal and then we literally took off to go flip boat docks. And that's when deja vu hit me because that's what he did in 2018. Right. Yeah. And he told me when we got there, he goes, this is all I've got, man. And, and like you said, there was no pressure. He didn't seem nervous. I think early that morning he was nervous when he caught that first big one, it, it all, he settled down and, and, you know, all that nervousness went away. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, it, you know, it was like deja vu hitting those boat docks again. Yeah. And, and everyone knows that Christy is the shallow water master, yeah. right? That's where he's going to go. It was weird watching him catch fish with a, you know, with a, a spinning rod um, to start the Bassmaster Classic, right? But but I think that showed kind of, and, you know, I, I'm literally shooting in the dark here. I don't know, but I feel like when you look at his whole game plan, it just showed how much more, mature you know what i mean not that not that he was immature in the last ones but what i mean is it's day one for the classic for everybody else if it's your first classic that's nerve-wracking but if you're jason christie and you've let it go into the final day the last two days there it, there is no nerve-wracking but i think everything he did was planned to win a tournament you know what i mean i'm gonna fish here i'm gonna even keeping his spectators at bay all week the way he fished and He's lost a tournament because of spectators. So he's game planning against everything. And I really thought it was a very, very mature, like a very, you know, different plan that you see in the past. And and I need to go back to the, the first big fish he caught. I don't know if you caught that clip or not, but when he caught it, he didn't know he had just caught like uh, a hybrid, a wiper. Or you know what I'm? Uh, yeah, yeah. A striper hybrid. Striper, a wi- yeah, and it was like oh, it was like. Is that what they're called? Wipers? Wipers. Yeah, they're white bass. I've never heard bass that. Hybrids. Yeah, um, that's what Wiper. they call them out west. Wipers. Yeah, uh, that's that's yeah. a. That's I'm a so thankful fish. nobody said that on stage because I'd be like, well, a wiper. What's wrong <laughs> with you? So he catches a hybrid, and it was a big one, and he hooks up on the next fish, and he's just going, man, I, you know, please, you could hear him in his head going please be a bass, please be a bass. And then when he got it, when he saw the, he saw white, when it came up in that clear water, he goes, Oh my God, it's a giant. And then he got in this athletic position, you know, because then he knows it's this, it's a five pounder. Right. So he swings it around the front of his boat and I'm man, I'm sitting there going, come on, Jason, come on, you know, land it. And he, he footballs or bread loafs this, this fish yep. gets it into the boat and he lips it and he's, and he goes, I, I feel, I was, no one could see it, but I'm like, I'm holding my camera and I've got my left arm in there going, <laughs> yes, you know, I'm, I'm super jacked for him. And he looks over at me and he goes, he just fist bumps me and he hits my hand like a hammer. He puts the fish in the live well. He goes back to the front of the boat and he goes, I don't know if you caught this, but this was funny. He goes, man, that just makes me want to like punch someone in the mouth. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> Did you hear that? He was live too. I, I didn't hear that, but but yeah, I'll send you the great clip. line. That is, a I'll great send you line. the clip. Yeah, and so that that was uh, that was that ignited. That was gas on the fire. You know that ignited him. But that was and early on day one, right? That was his first. I think that was his first fish that he put in the boat. Yeah, literally, see. like his third cast, and it was a five pounder. 
you know, it's like, that's the way to start the Bassmaster Classic. <laughs> yeah, that's why I missed it, because that's, you know, when I'm going back and forth to the oh. venue. So um, I get some of it, and then depending on the area you're in, you don't get other parts of it. But uh, that's an awesome line. It makes you want to punch somebody in the face. Make, in the in mouth. The, he said, makes me want to punch someone in the mouth. <laughs> and uh, I mean, and that's that's coming from Christy, right? Yeah, yeah. You know? So, yeah, so then he moves into the into the boat docks, and he's flipping boat docks, and he's, you know, it's just, he's just being Jason Christie. It actually reminded me, I was in the boat with Edwin Evers uh, at Conroe one time, and, and I took note of how he, you know, how he methodically moves his boat in and out of those tight slips and whatnot, and that's what Jason was doing, and, and, it wasn't like it was – he was catching one fish right after another. Yeah. You know? But the ones he was catching were some of the right fish, three-pounders, two and three-quarters, yeah. three-pounders, three-and-a-quarter, you know. And those those fish just start adding up over time. And he wasn't burning too many fish. You know what I mean? You did see a lot of people that were like, I caught 50 fish today. I caught 60 fish today. I think that can get you at the classic too, especially this one anyways. It proved to be. Right. So, so day one and how do you, what do you do? Like you at the end of the day, I don't ever see that part of it because I'm at the arena getting ready for the way. And so at the end of the day, do you just leave him at the dock? Is that how it, no, well, until the last day anyways? Normally. Yeah. But he asked me if I'd go get his truck to save him some time. So yeah. I just left everything in his boat. You know, we talked about, well, how much do you think you've got? And, and you know, it was, it was low. It was, it was bass track sandbag every day. Um, and, and he truly thought he had about 15 and a half pounds. And then he ended up weighing 17, one day yeah. one, which kept him in the top 10. I think he was tied in ninth with, with someone else, but that kept him in yeah. top 10 in the top 10. And it kept me in his boat. Cause that could have, had he been in 11th, yeah, I would have switched gone. to someone else. And the, the odds and you of might not back, have got him back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That was a key part of keeping the team together. Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I ran up and got his truck, backed his trailer down. He loaded up and that's when we parted ways. And, you know, I, I was uh, intently watching the way in um, from on what my happens. Phone. So do you like, are you, do you guys go to your rooms and just whoever, some people watch it, some people don't, or do you guys, like, what, what happens we go after out to that? Eat. Well, we, that yeah. day we went on, on Friday evening, you know, we go back to the camera trailer. We plug all of our, our batteries in, we make sure the audio is put, you know, getting recharged and we're putting new media cards in our cameras, just getting prepared yeah. for the next day. And then, uh, this year, it, it's really cool. Uh, we've had three events so far, and our entire camera crew, like, we function as a one, one unit. We used to be kind of split, and now we're like one unit, so we all decided we're going to go to dinner together, and we had two vehicles, so we're driving to a restaurant to go eat, but I've got my phone on live, way in live, yeah. Um uh, mounted on a magnet and uh, you know on the dash and we're all literally sitting there watching uh watching the weigh-ins so it was it was pretty cool all right so he comes to the arena i yell stupid stuff he is 17 and change you see him the next morning then what <laughs> yeah so the next morning it's it's kind of like okay well hold on we before again. you do that he, uh -huh. one thing i gotta tell you going into the next morning it was a nightmare getting in there on day one. There were so many people in the parking. I guess somebody sent everybody down the same road, which was a mistake. But it turned out they needed a road um, to divert the anglers. Overnight, the guys at Green Pond Landing put in a culvert and a road, which That's is insane. insane. So sorry to interrupt you, but I, that had to be said. I mean, Neil Paul, that whole crew, they are they are freaking rock stars it's amazing what they what they do i mean they've spent more money in renovations since the last time we were there than most venues will spend in you know have spent the last 20 years did they not build green pond that that ramp in that area for the classic so, yeah or yeah yeah okay and, and well that, i mean and major tournaments and then last time we were there we talked about the amphitheater like i was sitting there with neil paul 
<clears throat> I'm not saying I came up with the idea or anything. Several people probably did, but I was like, man, this hill is a perfect spot to have an amphitheater. We could just do a way in down here. Cause all the parking's up above it. And, uh, Lo and behold, you come back and they have built a freaking amphitheater. It, it's it's wild. So, um, I mean, that's know, one of those that's one of those business models of what when a when a, a town or chamber of commerce or a city or whatever invests in something like that. What that's their vision. They know what bass fishing, how big that is, and yeah. what can, that can do to their eco- local economy if they spend the money, invest in it. And I'm sure not just the classic, but all the oh. big events that go on there has a has a huge, uh, you know, is a huge part of their economy. Yeah, huge. I mean, it's it's, uh, it's busy all the time, whether it be a collegiate event or whatever. I mean, there that place is is rocking. Um, so you get with Christy on day two, you walk yep. down the dock, stuck day with me two, again. It's kind, of, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, Hey, Hey, <laughs> it's me. And, and we're going to go do this again. And, you know, unlike most elite events, this is a three day event. So yeah. day two is more important in the classic than it is. And I mean, they're all yeah. important, but it's way more important. It's, it's more of a, it's not as much of a pivotal point as it is a, staying keeper point in the yeah. classic right if, if those are the if that's the right language uh, but you know what i mean yeah so i go down day two and i said how do you feel he goes you know whatever i'm just gonna go fishing man you know the deal we're gonna do the same thing no big deal and i still think you know that's still his way or 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 athlete an athlete's way of keeping that calm yeah. maintained and not spinning out before you even press the gas, you know? Yeah. He made a lot of comments, like things like, Hey, the sun will still come up Monday. If I don't, if I don't win and stuff, which, which in one breath shocked me because I'm like, that's not the Christy that I know. You know what I mean? Like uh, it's not, that's not what I would expect to hear, but I also figure that's also a, a way of dealing with it. You know what I exactly. mean? Like, I don't, I don't, the more you say you don't care. I mean, you may care, but it helps you keep control. And, and I think too, losing to the way he did, particularly four years ago at Hartwell, yeah. put him in that, man, I know, I know what it's like to lose this. So, you know, I'm just, again, I'm just going to go fishing. And yeah. if I lose, I lose. If I, if I think about winning, I'm going to put way too much pressure on myself at this point. Cause no one, anything can happen on day two. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the same thing, although he did have more boats follow him into the drainage the next morning. And because they flipped takeoff, he was boat number five on day one. He's boat number 49 or 50 on day two. Yeah. So he's like, who's going to be in there when I get there? If anyone, surely someone's going to be there. So he shows up and right at the mouth of the entrance to that drainage is Matt Robertson. So he's like, you know, you could tell him like he did. I'm not going to say what he really said, but he said, you know, he, he was like, man, what do I do yeah, here? It just sucks. And he was like, should I, in his head, I think he was going, should I, should I just idle past him because it's a D it's a long drainage or should I turn around and leave and go do something else, but I don't have anything else. Uh Or should I ask Matt, you know, should I work this out with Matt? So he, he pulls up not too close to him, but he idles up close enough to where they can talk without screaming at each other. And he said, Matt, how, how are you going to go all the way back or what are you going to do? And Matt, he says, no, I'm going to, you could barely hear what he was saying. It's kind of muffled. He goes, can you repeat that? I don't know. I don't, I didn't hear you. And he, he stopped and he said, I'm going to go to that boat dock over there. And he pointed around to the third boat dock past him. And so Jason said, do you mind if I, if I hug this shoreline, if I, if I idle past you and go fish the rest of this drainage and Matt goes, no, nah, man, go ahead. So he idles around him, pulls up to the end of where Matt said he was going to stop fishing and starts fishing. 
and okay. he's he is immediately catching fish. The fish were smaller on day two, but there were still there were literally hundreds of fish in there that he was chasing around. You know, watching the bait the bait swim around and looking for bigger fish. But he was catching quite a few fish that more than he did on day one, but they were much smaller that day. Well, did he use live scope? A lot during, like, was it all live scope at that point? It was all live scope. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was all about live scope. We actually did. I love how all over the chat boards, they're like, Jason Christie won this classic without live scope. Yeah. Old school. Yeah. I mean, Sorry, his, Randy Blockett. I love having you on the show, but he didn't. <laughs> he did not. He was, he was, he was head down the whole time. And he was talking to me going, okay, here comes one. Yeah. You know, and he actually, he was using live scope so much that he actually missed fish because he was setting the hook on visually and not yeah. physically. Right. Yeah. So he missed, I mean, he was getting a little bit, not, not completely, but a little frustrated with himself because he was out of his, it, that's out of his style to do that. Right. Yeah. So yeah, but he, uh, he caught a lot of fish. He caught a limit, but I think his biggest fish there was probably about three, and a half, maybe four pounds. Yeah. Um, but mostly they were all like two pounders. So he rolls out of there. We do the same exact thing. He rolls out of there. He does go fish some new docks that he hadn't fished in day one because he felt like everyone was probably in the docks day one and during practice and all that. So he was looking. He didn't know what he was looking for, but he was looking for something different. Yeah. Again, this, being smart and managing what he's got, and you know what I mean. Like he's fishing; he really fished the tournament to perfection, if you ask me. And and this is where it gets really interesting. About midday, mid morning, early midday on day two, he's starting to notice that none of the spotted bass were that he was catching on the docks were out on the deep ends of the docks. He wasn't catching anything. He was catching them on the front end of the docks, specifically under the first float where the walkway and the docks meet. He and and he said to me, This is the this is where this is what no one knows but the people in the boat, right? Yeah. He said, dude, they're they're hanging out under this first float because they're just now pulling up to shallow water. And the, the lake is low, so there's no cover along the banks. This is where they have to go to stage before they move out to spawn. Wow. And so, look, look, dude, I'm like, I was like, wow. this. And, and at that point, I'm sitting to there thinking. To be so precise. Like to, to, be, to understand that about the, the, the nature of largemouth bass, particularly in that lake, to know that that could be a pattern that he needs to focus on. Yeah. was was detail detail yeah. so so then all of a sudden his power poles come into play like big time because he's starting to learn that he when he comes in either side of the dock he comes in at a 45 gets as close as he can and as stealthily as he can to get to where he can flip that first float and the walkway under the shade of the walkway he's flipping in there he pulls down at a 45 degree angle makes you know eight or nine extremely precise flips into cracks like that you know i mean this is just it was blowing my mind i'm going this is this is the difference between jason christie and a lot of people right yeah he, he's well, and when they get onto something, they, they know it. It's not exactly. like when, when an average angler thinks, I think they're at the front of the docks or whatever. We don't commit as much as, as these guys. So would he totally ignore the rest of the dock and just fish that one section or would no, he because still... he had to go around it. Yeah. He had to go around it. So he wasn't, he wasn't precision fishing, like flipping, like he, normally would he'd hit yeah. the back of the he'd hit the back of the, the the corners you know get in between the pontoons if it's a pontoon boat or whatever it was but then he would come on and then hit the back corner but then he would pull up or pull down as he got in at a 45 from a different angle and then I, I remember asking him I said are you doing this because you flip like 10 times on that backside and now you're on the front side making the same cast he's like 
Yeah, but what if they're facing the other direction? Yeah. So then this is this is no shit. He pulls out, goes to the next dock, and he looks down. He goes, look right there. And under that first float on the back side of it are two, three, or three and a half pounders wow. literally sitting there facing the other direction. And I zoomed in on it with my cameras, and I'm like, I, I'm, I'm telling you, Dave, is is as 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 true as the sun came up this morning. I thought to myself, he's fixing to win this tournament. Like he just got on a pattern that is so different. Maybe every other person out there is doing the same thing, but I, I just I don't believe that they are. He just he just found a pattern to get him from ten thirty in the morning until three o'clock in the afternoon. And he wasn't going to catch a fish out of every dock, but the ones that he was going to catch, they may come every 30 minutes or so, but the ones he was going to catch were going to be three plus pounders, three so to five or six pounders. There was times on live when we would see him fishing faster. And this was specifically day three. I remember it happening. And I remember um, our producer, Mike, in our ear saying, is, is he fishing faster right now? And then Davey that. made a comment that, like, yeah, he's definitely fishing faster. Um, maybe he's, it's he, nerves setting in or whatever. But, again, just shows totally not the truth. He's fishing faster because he's not in that right zone, so he's just covering water until he gets to those right do- – am, am I correct? I, I think there was a tad bit of spin out, okay? But – we got to go back to the drainage for if we're going to start day three. We got to go back to the drainage. Okay, no, no, no. We're not skipping forward. Okay. I'm just telling you how okay. stupid yeah. we are as commentators. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this the rest of this gets is really interesting because of how you're the second person that said he fished to perfection, and I call I, I'll get to that point that you just made about him fishing faster, but I call that the two minute drill. That's what he was doing. Like in football, yeah. that was the two minute drill. These were, these were all those flips were six, seven, eight yard passes to wide open receivers. He's just flipping, you know, until he gets to where he wants to be, but yeah. he knows that. And he said this, I still haven't caught that fish that you don't expect where you just make a flip. You might make a boom. flip out there yeah. to straighten your line out, and boom, you catch a five pounder on accident because you drug your jig by a stump or something, right? Yeah. And he still hadn't done that, so that was all part of that. Um, but so he catches the right fish, flipping those front floats, and there was part of it where some of the old dilapidated docks were were broken, yeah. or or offshore just enough to where the end of it was in the water and that angle that angle created a cave like underwater cave in shallow water it couldn't be too shallow but it couldn't be too deep so he started catching them in those in those little caves wow. he caught two or three like that and i was dude i was like it was a clinic on professional bass fishing because he was he was so tuned in and zoned in to two specific spots that's where he caught all of his fish so then he wasn't fishing docks how many times does he fish lake hartwell who knows right lots uh, yeah who knows and he started fishing docks he was like i've never even been here before but I mapped all this out last night to know where the shallow, the shallow docks were yeah. uh, that were, that were flat. And then he started looking for those docks that were in the walkways were in the water and they had one big float on the end between the walkway and the dock. And he just started focusing on those. And that's where he caught all of his freaking fish. And I mean, every one of them. So like when you're saying things that like we never heard, is he cognizant or anglers cognizant of when we're live and when we're not live? And oh, yeah. ne- like, I mean, and there's times when they're live and they don't think they're live, but I, I get the feeling that there's times when they're like, okay, I know for sure we're not live right now. So I can tell the truth. Is the, does that go on? Yes, because <laughs> it's my, <laughs> it's my job to let him know. Uh, totally. When yeah. he's live and when he's not. I mean, that is a huge part of my responsibility. And that goes back to, you know, Kenta and fighter, you know, smokers or chewers or dippers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's all part of that too, where, you know, representing 
representing yourself or using foul language or whatever it might be. And it's not about the fines. It's about respecting the, the people, the kids and the, the families that are watching Bassmaster Live, right? Yeah. And, and so, yeah, he was aware. I always say when McKinnis gives me a cue, we're coming to you in 10 seconds or stand by live one. We're coming to you next live to Christy. Then I say, Jason, stand by. We're coming to you live. I'll cue you when we're ready. And then 10 seconds later, I say, okay, you're live. And so he knows. And then yeah. when he, when we, when he's, when he's clear, I tell him, Jason, you're clear. So he's very aware of, of when he's live and when he's not. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. And that's they know good though. It, I think it should be that way. It's interesting that they know too. If I say you're live in a four box, they all know what that means. They're, they're not yeah. like, what are you talking about four box? You know, they know that they're in a quad framed split four way quad box on television and they understand that they don't have to say anything because if they go live full screen, they're expected to give yeah. us a, an update. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's part of the dynamics of being an elite bass fisherman with a cameraman in your boat. Yeah. And, and I feel like, again, that was part of his managing the tournament to, you exactly. know what I mean? To perfection. A hundred percent. I felt like if I can say this, I felt like I've been in Jason's boat. I don't know, three or four on three or four different tournaments, you know, over the past 11 years and I felt like he was more personable and looser, like not loot, not a loose cannon, but just kind of more relaxed and definitely more personable this time around. And maybe it was just because it was me and I've, we know each other. I've been in his boat, you know, and blah, blah, blah. But I just felt like he was a different Jason Christie going into this event and throughout the entire event. Until he started fishing fast. <laughs> so, so when did you when did you find him fishing fast? That when when they when yeah when Davey said it on on live and he said I remember he I remember the moment you remember and he said he just needs to slow down and calm down and and just be Jason Christie yeah. and I felt like I felt like he was getting a little nervous because do you want to start day three? Sure, sure. I mean, if, if hey, if this show's too long for you, turn it into two parts or three parts or whatever you want. But <laughs> just hit pause and come, yeah, and back, come back tomorrow back. and watch the rest of it. Yeah, perfect. So, so day three starts. He yeah. goes. He knows there's there. You know the the fields cut down. I'm sorry. I, I totally muffed this. It was day three that Matt Robertson. No, 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 no. I, I'm sorry. All the days are melting together to me. Day three, he goes back to his drain because again, this and he, is all day he's three. Got. Remember, he's le he's leading the tournament again. Tied, well, co leading tied it with, first. with Welcher, right? Co leading, yeah. um, and he pulls into the this drainage, and no one's in there. He's got it all to himself. Of course, the gallery and and the the flotilla has grown from day one, day two to day three. Yeah, there's way more boats, and and he goes in there and I wave, I put both of my hands up and I wave the flotilla down and I just said, stop. I don't know if I, if I, you know, if that's my, if that's my right to do that or what, but I just felt like, man, like this is day three. He's co-leader in this tournament. Here yeah. we go all over again. You know, let him, if he's going to lose it, let him lose it. Don't let the fans lose it for him. Right? Yeah. 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 And so I stopped him and then Sago texted me. Sago was the, the shooter, him and Dalton uh, Tumlin were the two shooters yeah. that came in and they were the first boats in Sago texted me and he said, ask Jason if, if I can come in or if this is far enough. So I asked Jason what he wanted Sago to do. And he said, no, just keep, just if he'll go to over to the shoreline and stay away from the drainage where all the stumps and all the bait fish are swimming around, then he won't interfere. And so Sago blocked the flotilla from coming in. And, and everyone was very, very understanding. They all knew what was going on, and they played the game the way it was. Like, that was the perfect gallery because it was huge, 
but they knew what they were doing as well. So kudos yeah. to that gallery. Yeah. Um, so Jason goes in and all of a sudden within five minutes, he's going, dude, this looks different. Like, why are all these leaves? There were, there were leaves floating everywhere. Like there, like a storm had come up that night or they raised the water level or they flushed the lake or it looked like a tornado had come in there because there was leaves all over the top of the water. He's like, I can't even make the right cast because the, there's so many leaves on the water. He said, this is something, something changed. And all of a sudden he's saying, now there's no bait fish and I'm not seeing any bass. I'm not seeing any catfish. I'm not seeing any, any hybrids, nothing, nothing's here. So no more than he, does he say that he hooks up and he's got this, huge like it's something big and it turns out to be about a 30 35 pound blue catfish right <laughs> and that took up 15 minutes of his time because he's on eight pound sunline right so he uh then he boats his first bass finally like 30 minutes of fishing in that drainage and it's pushing five pounds it's a yeah. big one but that's the only fish he caught that morning in the drain and he goes he is like man this is this is not what i expected i expected to come back here and catch two or three good ones and then fill my limit so i've got five in the boat when i leave here i've only got one fish he said that to me directly off camera and i said well if you think about it jason if you had one big fish and four little ones you're going to the boat docks to cull those anyway you'd still so, only have one fish Right. What does it really matter? What does it really matter at this point? And he goes, he looked at me, and goes, dang, that's a good point. So hmm. puts his rod down, pulls his trolling motor up. We leave the drainage and we literally, he was, he literally had to look at his map to see what he had mapped out because he did not know where he was going to go. He just had some spots, some new spots he had never fished before ever on Lake Hartwell. He had a mapped out based on, on, water depth so okay. that's where we went and that is that when is that when he started to fish faster no he was fishing his normal for love style. of god jake tell me when he started to fish faster i've asked you four five times i know right i'm there. wait i'm i didn't i don't want to i don't want to dominate the conversation so you are i, just, I wasn't there you, it's all about you just so you know <laughs> okay so we get to the first dock he starts flipping nothing, you know, he starts flipping and it's cloudy. They threw the, the, the skies changed, the waters changed. There's debris in the water. Like things are different. And I'm actually sitting there going, man, like, God, please don't let this happen. Yeah. again. Please don't let this happen again. I'm praying, you know, and I think he, he fished that way for a few hours and maybe caught one you know, mm -hmm. a two and a half pounder or something to add. I think that's what happened. He caught a two and a half pounder to add to his four or five pounder that he had in as well. So when he caught that one, it's kind of like, okay. He, and he said, I remember him saying, all right, see, this is what I have to do. I just have to keep fishing my style. Cause if I change, I'm going to spin out a hundred percent. I just have to stick to my guns and I'm going to live or die right here on these docks. And that's just the way it's going to be. So he's flipping more and more. And now all of a sudden, like at 12 o'clock or something, the sun starts to come out finally. And that, you know, that all of a sudden changes the game again because now there's shade under those docks. Yeah. And hopefully these, these fish start moving up. Sure enough, he gets to, it may have been his third or fourth fish. He hooks up, he does the same 45 degree angle, he pulls down and he flips into this shady float, you know, between the walkway and the dock yeah. and boom, he hooks up and this fish gets hung up in a rope in a tile. And I'm, yeah. I'm going, oh my, I'm filming this thing and I'm going, oh my God, please stay on. You could tell it was a three pounder, right? And, and he needs this fish bad not only for his confidence, but for his freaking live well, because yeah. he's only got two in the live well at this point. I think that's how it went down. So I'm thinking he starts to, he pulls up and he's starting to move forward really fast with his trolling motor. And I'm thinking, oh, his experience is going to take him in there. He's going to get to that fish. 
He's going to keep it. He's going to, he's hopefully yeah. going to stay hung up in that rope. And then he's going to go up there and lip the fish, grab the fish. So he has it secured. And then he's going to unhook yeah. it and put it in the boat. And all's going to be well, lo and behold, the fish jumps out of the water and spins and you're just going, Oh no, stay on and unhooks itself from the rope stays on the bait and he let any boat flips it in. And it's like, dude, when he came back to the back of the boat to put it in the well. I looked up at him. I said, you have got to laugh at that. And he just, he had this big sigh of relief and he started laughing. And then that's when he started fishing faster because he was, he had like two hours left in his day and he was just covering ground. But I also felt like he also felt like he thought, man, I'm not catching them with the freak at the frequency that I was yesterday and the day before yeah. I need to cover some ground or I'm going to spin out right now. Yeah. So that's when he started fishing faster. He, uh, for whatever reason, <clears throat> I mean, I, I told him two weeks ago in, in Florida that he was going to win the classic. And for whatever reason, dude, weird things happened that week. Like just, and it means nothing. But the first person I saw when I pulled up to the hotel and me and him didn't even talk because he was unloading stuff, but it was Jason Christie. And I was like, he's going to win the classic. <laughs> and although, you know, the, our media dinner and everything we had the night before and everything, I was like, that's who I, for whatever reason, I just said, Christie is going to win. The universe will not do this to Have him. Have it third, any other way. You know? yeah. Yeah. And, um, but through that, even though how confident I felt I was, you know, you, you get doubts at certain moments. That was a moment for me where I was like, he's going to win. I mean, I, I didn't even know if he'll weigh that fish in, but he's going to win. When fish start unlodging themselves from ropes, that's what has to happen for you to win. No, that's that's so true. And, you know, we talked about this before in one of the earlier segments where, you know, you asked me, do you like when they when they win a tournament, you just know, right? Everything's going right. This was one of those cases where strange things happened, but it was starting to almost fall apart. He, there's two hours left in the day, Dave, and he's got three fish in the boat. Yeah. And then he goes and he catches a 12 incher or a 12 or 13 incher, a, a pounder, right? And then he catches a pound three quarter. And that filled his limit. So it's almost like, well, now you've got five, but you still are going to have to. And I'm watching Bass Track, you know, knowing Welcher's sandbagging i know i've been in the boat with stetson several times i know he's weighing his fish yeah and and stetson let's i mean let's not forget stetson blaylock is in the background wearing them out right yeah and he caught almost 21 pounds he yeah. is like he is like blowing up having having a you know a, a championship day and everyone's thinking dude stetson blaylock's gonna come from behind out of fourth place and win this tournament and Jason Christie, like this is going to happen again. I think right? it's also called PTSD. It's post-traumatic <laughs> stress disorder. I, I think that's it, true. And I, I feel like you can't, you can't not start to think that unless everything goes perfect that day. If he goes out and catch them right away and everything goes perfect, you're like, it's meant to be, but you can't not think of that. Like even after he won that night, I was talking to him at the toast and he, before the toast, it was in the lobby. And, you know, I was kind of joking with him about a few little things that happened on stage and everything. And I said, did you think you won? And he was like, you know what? I honestly thought, I thought it was going to be a tie. Like I literally thought it was going to be a tie. So then this co conversation, I think Polnick was there and Bowman and um, uh, who else was there? Um, Drew Cook, I think was there a few, few different people were there, but this whole thing breaks out into, well, if there was a tie, you know, what would the right thing to do? And what the rule is, is sudden death fish off. And it would have been the next day and everything. And he's like, no, you can't be a sudden death fish off for, for a Bassmaster Classic. He's getting so passionate about it. And I'm like, he's easy. You, you won. won. There is no fish off. <laughs> but you can see even like those, there's wounds. That, a lot of wounds that got healed with this victory for him. Boy, I mean, dude, that's like. That's the quote of the day right there. I mean, that that is a fact. Those are deep wounds. And he's, that just tells you how much he's thought about this yeah. and all the things that can go wrong. I mean, he actually mentioned that before takeoff, and Shan did too, on, on, on Sunday. What if it's a tie? Because they were tied leaving the docks. 
yeah. you know, on day, th- the morning of day three. Right. So they actually thought, well, what are we going to do? And I remember thinking, I remember thinking, man, that would be weird if it was a sudden death fish off. You know, you got to have an extra day there. I, I don't know, but I just felt like as much as they put into this, give them time to fish. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I've never thought about it really like for an elite series. I agree 1000% with the sudden death fish off. There would be never a more exciting thing to watch. You couldn't turn it off because you'd, you'd know at any second, this could be one, but I agree for the classic. I do think that, I mean, and we don't make the rules, but I think it should be, maybe not a full day, maybe four hours. It's just something that they can, it's the classic, you know, you can't, it can't just go down to a a coin toss. And that's basically what a sudden death fish off in some ways would be, you know, there's some game planning, but you know, like, does he even fish the same way? Like it, it, if there was a four hour fish off the next day, you know how he'd fish, he'd fish the way he'd been fishing. If it was sudden death, he might just go out and try to jack a 12 incher somehow. You know what I mean? Right, Offshore. Right. So I agree with that. But um, as I'm often reminded, it doesn't matter what I think. <laughs> so, so as he's fishing faster, he's, you know, he's also thinking about where am I going to go next? And with two hours left, he's thinking about fish that he either missed. Oh, Dude, I've got to go back to this. There's there's so many things that happen. You know, you just get you get lost in all these little details. But there was a there was a fish that he caught at the end of day two that put him in position to be tied for first on day three. So he there's a dock all isolated by itself on this point. There's no other, yeah, there, I'm sorry, there's two docks there, but they're isolated and it's on this flat, right? And he had he had he had missed one there or he'd seen one follow a bait out during practice and he thought it was about four pounds. So he goes back there um the mor- or mid mid morning on day two and he flips. I think he flipped a like a uh a wacky worm in there into this corner because he missed, he missed on a, on a jig. He missed one. He he felt like he stung it and he felt like it was a good fish. So he flips a wacky worm in there and, and he missed it again. And he's like, dude, I saw it. It came out this time and turned on the bait. It's a four pounder for sure. (laughs) So he left and he wanted to upgrade. He wanted to upgrade late on day two so the very last boat dock he went to before he went back to check in was that boat dock thinking about that fish and he did instead of coming in on the inside of the float he went to the outside of the float picked up a wacky worm pulled down at 45 degrees in front of that float and flipped in there where that fish was and caught it and it was a four and a half pounder so wow. that 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 was like a pound and a half or two pound upgrade on that fish. So that was a pivotal, that was a really pivotal fish in my opinion that, that kept him, um, kept him on a roll and yeah. kept his confidence going. Right. Yeah. So, so moving again, back to the two hours left in the tournament. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> There's so good. many details. It's hard to remember. Right. You're good. So day three, two hours left in the tournament. He's thinking about the fish that he saw, a six-pounder here, a five-pounder there, a four-pounder. He's like, the only chance I have is to go back to those fish and try to catch them wherever they might be in these areas. So that's what he did. So it was literally pull up to a boat dock, make 10 flips, jump back down in the seat, put my camera down, go again. And it it was hit and run, hit and run, hit and run, hit and run. And it was, you know, it was like, three to four minute boat rods between hits where he wanted to go because he's hitting specific areas. Yeah. Then he ran out, he ran out of those fish that he knew where they were, didn't catch any of them. So he literally started like looking down, looking down, uh, uh, pockets to see if there were any boat docks in there that he liked. Wow. He pulls into this boat dock. He's, he's, he's headed back to, the ramp getting closer so that he could manage his time properly. All right. There's 30 minutes left. He still got a one pound fish and a pound and three quarter fish in his live well. 
and he did not know where he was going. He was just fishing. He pulls up to this dock that he liked. It was isolated. It was like by itself, right? Yeah. And he flips in there to the front of the dock. Boom. A two and a half pounder or a three pounder. I don't even know anymore. I, it was so crazy and intense. Yeah. I don't even know. But it was an upgrade. Like he didn't even have to look. He just threw it in as well, grabbed the little fish and tossed it. And then he went to another dock or two docks later. Now he's got 15 minutes left before he's got to get back to, to the check-in, right? On day three of the yeah. classic, he thinks he's behind because he hasn't done enough to win the classic. He pulls up to another dock and boom, catches a two and a half or three pounder, whatever it was, and upgrades his last fish. And it was like, that was it. The day was what whatever is going to happen now is going to happen. And destiny is in the hands of his live well at this point that there was no more fishing. It was over. And we pulled up to the dock. I didn't say anything to him because I, again, we've talked about this before in my head, I'm going, should I just like get out of his boat and go away <laughs> or, <laughs> or what do I do here? And he said, I said, how much do you think you have? I had just texted Zona because in my head, I'm going, he's got a four pounder, a four pounder, a three, a three, and a three rounded up. That's 17 pounds. I'm going, man, I, I, you know, he opened his live well and I looked in there. I said, those fish are three pounders. There's no way they're not. And I texted Zona. I said, just so you know, you know, bass track is what it is, but I think personally he's got 17 pounds. So he said, he texted me back and said, what does Christy think he has? And I looked at him and said, what do you, realistically, what do you think you have? He said, no more than 16 and a half, probably 16 pounds, but I think I've got about 16 and a half. And I said, okay, well, he goes, now you're making me feel like I have a shot at this because he thought he blew it again, right? Yeah. And I said, Jason, I have no idea because you know Welcher – you know, he was a professional poker player. He sandbag, <laughs> he sandbag in his weight. Stetson, you know, I, I, tell, I, I did say Stetson caught him, but I don't know what his weight is. I just know he caught him. And so this is going to be a really close ending. All I can tell you is you've got a shot. And he looked at me and he goes, dude, I think I'm going to throw up. <laughs> <laughs> so Zona is still alive when you're texting him that? Mm-hmm. So, um, and did, did Zona report that on live? Like what? what? I, don't I don't know because I went off calm. Yeah. I, I had no idea what happened after that because stop, we weren't. Stop, stop posting, stop sending stuff like that to Zona. You guys are trying to destroy my job. I like <laughs> that they lied on Bass Track. I, Do what I you didn't. want, anglers. I'll give you a thousand dollars to lie. <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> I didn't text you because of that factor. And yeah, because I had no idea. Like, I swear to you, like, when I didn't think Stetson, I thought there was a chance for Stetson, like, through my head during the weigh-in. I'm like, I, and I hadn't looked <clears throat> at Bass Track or anything for the last few hours. Um, but when Stetson weighed in, I thought, ah, that's a good bag. It's the biggest bag of the tournament. I mean, it's a great bag of fish. But I felt like he needed to have 21 to have a shot. Like, I just felt like 21, 22, he had almost four pounds to make up. Right. So, and then when Welcher weighed, I was like, Oh boy, Kyle Welcher could have just won the Bassmaster classic, which I'm obsessed by. I think Welcher is one of the coolest dudes out there. Um, I have from the first day I met him, I'm like, he is going to be a superstar in this. He sport. is really good. Incredible. Like, and I don't mean just technically whatever, like he, it, what stands out to me in the, in the, in the greats, they think different. They don't think, they don't think like other people. They're more detail orientated. They look at things from a different, and he's always been that way. Like from the first day I met him. So I think Welcher is amazing, but I did think, man, there's a shot, but I still, I was like, Jason Christie's going to win this. Like I, I didn't. Um, and, and evidently he did by five ounces, but it, it um, I don't know. How did I even get on that topic? <laughs> well, well, it's just because we were talking about Stetson. Because Stetson on live, I heard him in the comms say to Davey, or maybe it was you, 
he said, no, I, I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, th these other guys are probably catching them. I have no idea, but I felt like when I left the dock for me to win, I was going to need 22 or 23 pounds. And I remember him specifically saying that. And then I started doing the math thinking, yeah, that's probably what it would take if these guys catch 17 pounds, he's going to yeah. have to have 22 pounds to win, right? Or, or yeah. 21 plus. So, you know, I actually, I go get Jason's truck, back it down in the water. We pull up to the, the bump station at the top of the hill and he goes, do you really, I mean, do you really think I've actually got a shot at this? I said, yes, Jason. I mean, that's all I'm going to say because I don't want to, I don't want, nor I don't want to ruin this for you, nor do I want to get your hopes up and then yeah. have it be Debbie Downer either. I, I, I'm, I'm out, dude. Bye. <laughs> you know, I gave him a hug and I walked back down to the trailer and then, you know, we watched, we were, we, we hauled, like we, we packed everything up in the camera trailer and we wanted to get to weigh-ins because that's just such an exciting thing. We've all got backstage passes so we can get down on the floor yeah. and it's just like, you know, we get to absorb all this high energy. I um, saw you guys, you were right up to the right-hand side of the spectators there. And I said that, I actually, at one point, I was getting set to, like, point all of you guys out. And oh. something happens, in, you know, like it was on plan, but I was going to be like, hey, these guys are fans as well. I thought it was just cool to see, because it wasn't just you. It was everybody down there. The whole team, again. Yeah. We're, and we everybody function. had cameras. I don't, you guys are going to put the still camera guys out of business, so stop it. <laughs> I, know, I know. We've actually <laughs> talked about that. <laughs> Not that we want to put them out of no. business, but that we need to respect. <laughs> we need respect you know, th those guys in space or whatever. Come on, but, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, you're going through all the, all the, all the anglers, you get to Stetson. He weighs what? 2011. Was that his 20 weight? pounds, nine ounces, I 20 pounds, was. nine ounces. Okay. Yeah. Then I'm thinking I'm doing the math going, Oh my goodness. Then Welcher comes up and he weighed 17, 17.4, I don't, I think 17.4, 17.5, one of 17 and change. Yeah. And one of the other camera guys turned, Seth Doman turned around. He goes, what do you think? I said, man, I don't think so. I think he's going to lose this by three or four or five or six ounces. I don't see 17 and a half pounds in his life. You, you thought Jason was going to lose at that I point. I thought Jason was yeah. going to lose. And I'm just going, oh my God. I'm like starting to get sick to my stomach again going, I'm never going to go. I'm never, I will never talk to Jason Christie again. Cause he won't let me <laughs> if, if this happens and dude, when, when he came out and they're standing there, they're both, uh, Jason's got his hand on, on uh, Welcher. Welcher's back, you know, like camaraderie, like man, yeah. you know, good luck. You know, I hope you're an ounce less than me or whatever, but he's standing there and everyone's waiting in those two seconds that go by that everyone's watching the scales. The whole place is quiet and they're, you're waiting for those numbers to come up. It seems like two seconds seems like a minute, you know, yeah. it seems, imagine seems like being for, the guy that's got to call the weight, right? Like I'm all like, that's the <laughs> moment where I stop and think I'm like, Holy crap, everybody, like it doesn't matter whether they're in this building or they fish another circuit or whatever. Everybody who cares about bass fishing is watching right now. And all that goes through your head. And then all of a sudden, like it's almost instant, like it just it's like fireworks. You know what I mean? It's like there's everybody watching, watching, and then it's like a bomb wow. goes off in there, man. I mean, it's like it's like yeah, it's like fireworks. It's like the 4th of July. The, the bomb goes off, and it's just insane. But before, like he was, Christy was watching so closely, and before you could say, 17-9, Jason Christy, he's already reaching back with his fist. So it was like all of it happened all at once yeah. in slow motion. And when you said, 17-9, Jason Christy is the new best master. Classic champion. It was like I was literally screaming, going, Yeah. And the whole place just erupted. erupted. It was yeah. un for every single person in there was happy that Jason Christie finally won the Bassmaster Classic Classic. It was like and a it relief. Was, it was like everybody was, was and then, then they were like, Well, he's lost so much. We need to make sure he 
you know, enjoys this one. Yeah. The, the, and there was a timing off there and Bowles was great. Like I remember he turned to me and he said, you ready? Like to hold before he put the bag on, but trip would always kind of turn his computer or in his back and guys oh. COVID has taught guys to look at that computer. And it's actually uh, something I'm going to bring up that we need to fix because because the timing is off. You know what I mean? Like Jason Christie found out before anyone else you wanted to be instant. It was cool. It was great. But but I but I missed the trip angling himself so the guy couldn't see. Blo- he's his, blocking. His yeah. Hey, that's years real, of experience, right? Real quick trip story. This was one of the coolest things that happened at the classic for me personally. So trip, did you see him on day one? He was there at takeoff. Did, I don't know if you saw no, I, him. I, I missed that. I mean, there were several thousand people. It's easy to miss. But you know this. Uh, most people don't know this, but um, all the years that me and Trip worked together, he would always, you know, like I'd be, you're on a jam busy dock announcing whatever, and I'd just see his arm come through with his phone. You know what I mean? Like, it, and it would <laughs> it would have the clock on it, like showing right, what time right. it was right to the second. The official clock, yeah. Yeah. So I'd always, and initially when I first started, I was like, why does this, does he think I'm going to miss it or something? But then in time, I just realized he was helping me. And it, it was one of the things I went to rely on because I never had to look at the time. You just keep talking and you know, you're not going to, you're not going to miss it. Well, I'm on the dock at takeoff. There's thousands of people around. And uh, all of a sudden this phone comes through a group of people into my face. And I'm like, well, it was the coolest way. And I'm like, trap. Wow. But it was, it was really wow. cool for me. So it was cool seeing trip there. And, uh, and, and what a perfect way for him to kind of find me on the dock. I just, I, I really enjoyed it personally. That's awesome. That, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is that it? No. <laughs> No, I mean, the excitement in the arena was like, (laughs) it was like, you're like, it was like the home team just won the Super Bowl, you know, confetti's flying, smoke's flying. People are literally, there were, we were high-fiving people that we didn't even know. It was like the home team won the Super Bowl. And well, because remember, they've also seen him lose. And I don't mean just like at other classics, that crowd, a lot of the people that were in that arena were there when he lost it. You know what I mean? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, there was a lot of deja vu going on for me every single day, the same doc, you know, the same, the scenarios were really going down, except that he didn't have a six pound lead going into championship Sunday. He was tied, but he was tied for first either way. He was in the lead, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, it was, it was, it was, I mean, I can't even tell you how, I mean, I have a lot, you know, we have so many friends that fish on the elite series and you want all of them to win. You want all of them to succeed. Mm-hmm. And I have some really close friends that I've made over the, particularly over the past couple of years, like Lee Livesey and yeah. Polinick and, and Caleb Sumrall that I'm really tight with. Patrick Walters, Bill yeah. Lowen, we duck hunt together, right? And and you want these – and these guys are – some of these guys are in the top 25, and some of them are in the top 10, right? And you are even close to it, and you want them to win and succeed and have all that success. But for me as a camera guy – there's an extra little bump for the guy that I'm with because I'm on his team that day. And yeah, of course, and, and that, the, the, that the satisfaction of uh, hearing you announce Jason Christie as the Bassmaster champion and watching him smile because not that he's a morbid person at all, but he, you know, he's, he's all to himself usually. Yeah. Right. And he keeps his emotions tight to his chest, and he's not a real emotional guy. And to see him react the way that he did was extremely satisfying. And then all of a sudden, you know, that right there, that's really who Jason Christie is. When he lets his hair down, lets his guard down, that's Jason Christie. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, – I just felt relief for him. That's what I saw when he went over to the side and he put his head down and everything. And then he came back and he was getting emotional. And I, I just remember saying to him, dude, you got all the time in the world. Like I didn't want him to feel like he was rushed to come to the microphone because I feel like 
that's one of the things I hate when an MC is like always right in the person's face. Let that person have their moment because what they're going to say with their body language is so much more important than what you're going to try force them to say. You know what I mean? Like, agree. uh, My job is. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. You go ahead. Well, I just think that my job as an MC isn't to be. I'm on the stage, but I'm only on the stage to make the stage bigger and brighter. And I don't mean with my presence. I mean, with it for bigger and brighter for the angler. You know what I mean? Like that's sure all. I'm an amplifier for the angler. So somebody's going to yell something to, you know, announce the moment, but I don't feel like it's their moment. You know what I mean? And I think you always have to let it breathe, like let it, It'd be, it'd be the same difference as you, like when some when an angler loses a fish, don't say anything. Just keep on that angler and let's see what goes through their mind or when they catch the fish. You know what I mean? Like you, if all Go of a tied to his face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just so you know what's going on. And I remember thinking uh, yesterday when you let it breathe, Dave, I remember thinking, dude, he this is what makes, you know, Mercer knows what he's doing. He's done this enough. He understands the inner emotions of people and understands how important that is. And I remember thinking to myself, he's doing the right thing. He just stepped away. He back, he just sort of got out of his way and let all that energy come out and let everyone focus on Jason Christie as he was, he was, he leaned over backwards. Like he was going to throw up, you know, he was emotionally spent at that moment and you let that happen. And that was really cool. And then when he came to the microphone, I mean, he was very precise about all the things yeah. that he said and how he said it. Um, and, and I thought that was really cool too. How, how together he was after that moment occurred. Yeah. But, but he never would have been if I tried exactly. to get, you know, um, exactly. And, and I, dude, d- don't turn this into a compliments about me because I think that anybody could have emceed that evening because it was so exciting. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's storybook stuff. Um, but it was, it was just a really cool, really one of the cool moments were <laughs> that nobody sees. And I loved this moment out of Hank I'm backstage and I'm like, it's while the super six is going out. And I'm like, Hank, when you do the handoff, you need to get away because there's going to be a lot of streamers. There's going to be a lot of like stuff. And he turns to me. He's like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and it was such a, and dog. he does. <laughs> it, and he does. And he normally would never say something like that, but the way it right. came out of his mouth was so great. It was, uh, he, he is a great champion. He is. Yeah. I mean, Hank, Hank Cherry is that guy. He's always doing something for someone else in need. And I love that about Hank Cherry. Yeah, no, he's I mean, great. He's great. That's I got to so ask cool. him something, though, because on stage, he said, I didn't follow up with it, but he was saying something. He's like, I used to be a jackass, but I'm not anymore. And I'm, and I, it was a classic and it wasn't the right moment. But any other time I would have followed up. But what, when what, what do you mean you were a jackass? But I do want to ask him what he meant by that, because I think I personally think he meant I think a lot of these guys that go big time, you win a classic or you win, you know, two or three or four elite events and you become a superstar. And I think, I think a lot of these guys go through that where there's an immature level of, of character that goes into your first three, four five years. And then when things, when your career changes, you realize you were an idiot, you know, the things that you said or the things that you did getting mad at locals or saying something to another angler, whatever, whatever that might be. And I think they realize when they become a true professional that, you know, that's a different person back then. Yeah. But I also think that's life. Like, I think if you're Agreed. realistic, every 30 year old thinks, wow, I said some stupid stuff when I was 20 and every 40 year old says, man, I was pretty full of myself when I was 30. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's just oh, 100%. You, it's the natural progression. Um, but uh, no, it, it was, it was phenomenal. And then uh, here's a cool thing that nobody got to see, but uh, I mean, you've heard me talk and everybody watched this podcast, heard me talk about how special Bob Cobb is to me and to the whole industry. And um, what well, just so happens, Bob's in the lobby 
on our way back, you know, like I, I went ran upstairs, got changed quickly. And, you know, I'm supposed to go over to, to talk at the toast. Um, so we're in the lobby of our hotel at the Hyatt and Bob Cobb's there. So I'm talking to Bob. Well, while we're talking, Jason Christie walks in. And so anyways, Jason, I brought Bob up to introduce him, Jason Christie. And I'm introducing him and Jason Christie's like, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, this is, this is wild. And I said, well, do you, do you want Bob to introduce you? And he's like, would you? So I actually got Bob Cobb to come with me to the toast. And it was just awesome because Bob Cobb introduced Jason. I mean, he said the year wrong and and, and (laughs) fine. (laughs) He told me he's stuck in 2020. Um, (laughs) We all are really. We all are. Yeah. um, But it was just awesome. Like to hear his voice on the microphone and to watch like to walk into that room and there's all these elite series pros. And there's some of them young guys that don't even know who Bob Cobb really is, to be honest. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But then there's some young guys too, that you're just like, Austin Felix is like, that's Bob Cobb. Like, you know, like the, it, he is such a presence imagine. in every room and it's just so cool. So it when was, his voice it, came up. That had to be like a head turner. Just, oh, yeah. just his voice to recognize that. Right. Yeah. It was, it was really cool. That was, um, uh, one of the best, you know, I loved, and I loved it for Bob. You know what I mean? Because Bob didn't have a lot of rev- relevance for years. You know what I mean? Like kind of that part of history. And I love that we're allowed to include it all. And it's a big part of that. Um, I had one really bad experience at the classic though. <laughs> What's that? I don't know. I don't know if this is even official yet, but I think it is. <laughs> um, so Yamaha has this award, the Yamaha top performer or whatever. And how it was explained to me, which was kind of awkward during weigh-in, was it's either going to go to Christy or Takumi. So when Takumi weighs in, and because Christy was going to be last, he was going to either win or lose, they wanted to make sure that that was announced. So it was kind of awkward to bring Takumi up and give him like this big $20,000 check, and, check yeah. <laughs> and be like, well, maybe you can keep it. Um but we got through that. He's Takumi. He's so great on the microphone. It's so awesome. It's so easy to do anything with him. Then after the tournament, somebody came up to me and said, well, Takumi won that. Um, Michael Middleton actually told me that. And I, you know, our, my producer at the arena and, uh, and I said, Oh, that's great. So I'm walking into the hotel on my way back that night and I see Takumi and I'm like, Takumi, you won. And he's like, I won. <laughs> So happy. He's like, oh, I need money. <laughs> He's so happy. So it turned like, out to be good. It turned out to be a good thing. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. <laughs> Stick with okay. me. Okay. So, so Takumi's like, uh, and he's like, well, they never told me. And I'm like, well, as far as I know, you won because it's the top finishing Yamaha person that doesn't win is what Middleton told me it was. And then that night, Takumi asked me to take a picture of him and Christy with the trophy. And while I'm taking the picture, I'm like, you want him $20,000. <clears> and he's like, how? And I said, well, Yamaha Power Pray. And Christy's like, no, I won that. And I'm like, and Takumi's like, I didn't win. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh. So um, It's like I'm, telling a little kid that. Well, it wasn't my fault. I got screwed <laughs> over by the rules. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I'm never telling anyone they win anything ever again unless um, it's official. It's official. So either Christie's going to be upset that he didn't get it or Takumi's going to be shattered. And I mean, Christie got lots. So come on. He, give he, won, it to a Takumi. Money. he won a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he won a lot more than that, though, man. I, I just think oh, that he did. You could see, you know, he was wearing that like that weight was on his shoulders. And, and that's also why I think. I don't think that there's any way that a Jacob Wheeler and people like that don't come back to bass for that very reason. You know what I mean? Like the, you, that, it, how many you got to win? How many do you, and it, it's nothing against MLF. It's, it's like, you say whatever you want, but at some point you're going to get tired of answering questions about how come you've never won a Bassmaster classic. And exactly. I mean, who wants, those- to, who wants to be the Dan Marino of bass fishing, right? Even though those guys are in a, their own league in a different league, it's still the Super Bowl of bass fishing. Yeah. And so, and if you're really, really great, okay, well then come back and win the classic, right? 
Yeah, no, it, it was, uh, it was a wild week. Um, they cooked my voice again. <laughs> That's why my voice sounds like I've been smoking all week. Um, dude, the sound and lighting people we work with are awesome. They do like, if you really look what JM and that sound and lighting company have done since they took all this over, um, it's incredible. Like our stage and lighting stuff is awesome. They are the best in the business, but they're stage and lighting people. So it never fails. I'm allergic to the dried ice stuff they use. So, um, day one, oh. they, they hardly used very little of it. Then day two, I'm like, Hey, keep it like that. And you can turn this place into a pool hall come Sunday. Um, well, they didn't like the, if you look at the footage from the first 15, it is like oh, smoke everywhere. And I can, like, as soon as I can, I don't, I, I feel it before I even t- can see that there's too much. Cause you just feel it starting to shut mm-hmm. down. So anyways, um, but the, the reason I tell you that story, that's funny. So horrible feeling to go into the final day wondering, like, am I going to be able to announce this? Like, it's the, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's voice erectile dysfunction. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> it happens to, it happens to everyone. Well, no, not at the classic. It shouldn't. Um, so, uh, so never mind any of that, but on the, so Larry, the guy that runs the sound and lighting place, he comes up with this great idea and he's like, we're going to put a fan behind you. And then what that's going to do is that's going to push all the smoke away from you, but we can use smoke and it worked and it was great. But here's the problem. <laughs> the, the fan at certain times started like blowing my shirt. <laughs> I saw, I saw that. I saw you put your hand in your pocket to took it. <laughs> but the best part is at one point I am. So I've got this thing and I'm a chunky man. <laughs> so I don't, I don't need my shirt blowing out any more than it already is naturally. Um, but at one point, I'm actually interviewing, I think, uh, Justin Hamner. And it starts, like, really blowing it up. And I, like, in the middle of the interview, I guess just reactionary, went and pushed it down with, like, the microphone. And I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> it was quick. It was a quick, it was a quick knee-jerk reaction. I, I remember all this, actually. <laughs> but then you switched hands, and you put yeah. your right hand in your pocket to keep that side of it down. <laughs> I'm telling you, Dave, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm telling you at that moment, I was going, is there a fan blowing up from un, like the Marilyn Monroe? It's what, it, that's what it was. They were turning yeah. me into Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was to keep the smoke away. And I think uh, it worked for that. But next year, I think I better tuck in my shirt or something. <laughs> um, but it, I mean, it was, it was as good a Bassmaster classic as I've ever been to. Like I, that last day going in with that many people in contention. I mean, I said it a bunch on live and I really believe it. There hasn't been since Pittsburgh where I felt like that, like anybody could win today. Um, and I know that, and I, and I also think that the fact that anybody could have won that day and the fact that it started as a two way tie and it ended with those two dudes is exactly the way it should have been, you know? And, and I, as much as it's crushing for Welcher, it's going to build to his story. You know what I mean? Like exactly. It, um, his day's coming. Oh, his day's co- Stetson's day is coming. You know, Kyle Welcher's day is coming. A lot of those guys days are coming. And I think the, these, those, what they experienced are those moments that build up to that point, just like it did with Jason Christie. I mean, yeah. you know, if he would, if he would have lost it again this time, I mean, I think that would have let some air out of his more air out of his sail, don't you think? Oh, I, dude, I, I, with everything I seen this weekend, like I think if Christie loses this event, yeah, I mean, I he's too good to say that. The, but I'm telling you, irreparable damages. Like, really, he, I mean, he, you could see and feel all of that come out of him. And I think if you go through that again. And people are going to say, well, Aaron finished second and fourth in four of them. And he did. But those weren't all events that he was leading going into the last day. had a big lead and and, and watched it get taken from him. Um, It's a whole different experience. So I I do think if and what but on the opposite side, he did win. And what does that make him now? Like how much more scary is Jason Christie now? Um, Right. Exactly. So did you see him at all after 
after the famous hug that we started this show talking about? Yeah, I followed. I, ra- I followed the boat back into the bay uh-huh. and where they stopped the boat. Um, you know, talk to Zona, talk to Tommy Sanders, talk to McKinnis, talk to Ronnie Moore, and, and went over to the Express. Clay Connors, a really yeah. good friend of mine, and Rory Herndon's a good friend of mine, the owner uh, or the the president at Express Boats, and you know, congratulated them. And then uh, Jason walked by, and dude, he had he had this glaze over his eyes. And he just looked like a zombie because when does that set in? Like, when do you, that is, it's like a things you, he, does he even remember that? Because he was in such a zombie mode that I'm sitting there going, wow, this, this is truly incredible to be, for him to have this experience, right? Overwhelming. I'm sure he doesn't remember that. Like, I'm sure he will because he'll watch it and see it and, and it'll be recounted to him. But I, I mean, there's things that happen on stage with me during those moments that I never thought about. And I didn't like, I honestly, the, the Christie conquers the classic as simple as that seems. I didn't, I couldn't think of anything beforehand. Like I try to think, did you ad lib that? That just 100%, came out. Oh. dude. It, all of the good ones are like that. Like any of the like cherry on top. I never thought about that before. The unbelievable. <laughs> like you can hear me putting that together with the first time I said it because I was just like unbelievable. Unbelievable. Like you know what I mean? It just became. Um, and luckily, both those did happen the next year, so it was really easy. Um, so Jason Christie should, but he, but conquers the classic wouldn't work again next year. Um, but it, but that's what it felt like to me at that moment. You know what I mean? Like he conquered the classic. That's literally what that moment was. It wasn't about money for him. It wasn't about it. No, he, the trophy even. Like I mean, the trophy is going to be the piece that you keep and you you look at, and it's everybody has reverence around. But for him, he beat. 2018 was it and 2016 whatever those years were where he got the second it was all of that went out of him and uh and it really was like he conquered the classic but that's what i'm saying like there's a lot of stuff that it happens so quick and that's also why you can say some stupid stuff in that moment too like (laughs) i I mean over the years you do and some of them you're like "Ah, i didn't like that one at all and some of them work and some of them don't and and it's also very judgmental. I'm sure some people hated it and liked it, but I, I figured it spelled it out right. He conquered the classic. I mean, that, and that's what that week was all about for him. So um, I'm sure he has to watch it because um, it's just nuts. Like it, it, so much is going on. Like I, I try to get off the stage and I'm back there, you know, yelling whatever I'm yelling while he's holding the trophy then his fiance comes up and we're like this far from each other's face. And she's screaming like literally, ah, <laughs> and, and, which you should. Um, and you know what I mean? Like it's just so much. And then she kind of ran out there. I think she went out a little prematurely, uh, probably got hit by some jets and stuff like that, but they had a quick embrace. And then she probably got tired of getting pelted with stuff and she left and he held the trophy and then they got back. To, it was, it's just, but no matter how much you try to plan it, it never, you, you know what I mean? Like spontaneous I, combustion, really, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, you know, the, the, the thing I remember when you gave Jason the mic after his, you know, his lean over is his breathing moment, right? His breathing room, you gave him the mic or you held the mic to his face. And he said, the first thing he said was, I thought a lot about a lot of people, you know, I'm thinking about kids. a lot of people right now, but the people I'm thinking about the most are my kids. And then he pointed out Shan's family. He said his future family and he went straight to family first. And I thought that was huge Yeah, that that he did that. And that was all organic and natural. But I feel like, again, that was one of those, see, see that intimidating Jason Christie. I mean, that's his game face, but there's, there's that Jason Christie on the inside that we mostly don't get to see. He's he's our Clint Eastwood. I, I've always no used that example for him. You know That's what I mean? Great like an analogy. Don't think of like today's Clint Eastwood, but I'm saying like when Clint was young, people very good looking man. You know what I mean? 
intimidating, but without yelling and screaming, he was just intimidating because of his presence. And that's, that's who Christie is. You know what I mean? Like um, Hackney's got that personality too, but Hackney's got one of the greatest character caricature faces. So it builds to that. Like when he looks over his shoulder, somebody's yeah, yeah. like his face. I mean, me and Overstreet talk about it. I mean, Hackney's face is always showing an emotion of some sort, but Christie carries an emotion. It's almost like, like it's, it's uh, he's, he's a, He's an incredible dude. Um, he really yeah. he truly is. Yeah. That was, yeah. that was so cool. And, you know, people are talking about it all over the internet. It was, it was literally like a post Super Bowl, uh, you know, time or era after the classic. And it, it was, it was, it was really, really big for a lot of people, man. Yeah. That was wild. And, and I'm lying. I did think of stuff before I went on stage. Just tell you what the two things that were going through my head while I was waiting for that wait. Jason Christie, classic champion. <laughs> and then I, I had Welcher world champion in my head. I'm like, I could go. But but neither of them would have. Like, both of those kind of suck, really, when you think about it. You know you're what running I mean? Out like, of time trying to figure out what you're going to say, though, right? But You've like, only got think- so much time to think about that. Like, I think if Welcher won, it would have gone a totally different direction. Like, I don't know. I probably would have put shock into it because that would that would have been the emotion. He shocked the world. Like, if Welcher beat him, everybody thought Jason Christie was going to win. But if Welcher beat him that day, he would have shocked the world. So it probably would have gone some way, some direction there. But it's it's weird how those things, like, I wish my mind, trust me, I wish my mind could prepare, but it can't. My mind is very lazy and it's like a lion. It sits on a hill. <laughs> doesn't run unless it's time to eat. Uh, so my mind sits on a hill a lot and every once in a while it works, but uh, it was a great event for, for and not just for Christy. I mean, I think it was a great event for a lot of like, I, it's cool to see a lot of the young elite series pros kind of coming into their own, even people that are just so new, like uh, Matty Wong. I mean, what he did at the weigh-ins is freaking awesome. Like he, it, and I heard there was a giant lineup for him at the expo. You know what I mean? And he's the Bass Nation champion. And that's what I love about Bass. Like you, you can literally win the Bass Nation championship, fish two Florida events, then the classic, make a check in one Florida event. But what he did at the classic, you know, and now he's got a lineup because it's just addictive. You know what I mean? Like people love that personality. I think other than my running with Takumi, it was a big week for him. I think it was a big week. For Welcher, too. Like, um, you know, I think this is a lot of people are going to start to know him from this. You know what I mean? Um, oh, he's he's like you. I think you said it best earlier. He's an incredible angler. Like yeah. he knows what he's doing and he's going to he's got a huge future ahead of him. I went up to him. I probably didn't say the right words as I was walking out of the arena. There's he was nothing still right to say at that moment though. There I isn't mean, like it's no probably what better not to even say anything, right? But I went up to him and I sh- he was still sitting in his boat and his girlfriend was in there or whoever, you know, ever significant other was sitting in there and I, believe I went married. up I shook his hand. They are married. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is why. So I went up to him and I shook his hand. I said, um, man, congratulations. That was an incredible tournament. And you know, what I really wanted to say was, dude, I know this hurts, but you are, you, you are an incredible and everyone in here knows it and your day's coming. Don't worry. And you just, you know, you, you lit the world up with what you did this weekend. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because his family came up to me. His parents came up and uh, they were like, thanks for, you know, they're good parents. So whenever you say nice things about their kid, they're going to come up and say thanks for doing that. But they were telling me how, like, I started calling him Stone Cold Kyle Welcher this weekend. Mm -hmm. And weirdly enough, like that is something I thought of a long time ago. And like when I first met him, I'm like, he is stone cold Kyle Welcher. Like, because you talk to him and it's just so analytical and it's, you know, even his whole process through losing, there was no collapse. There was no nothing. He was like, all right, I'm out of here. This sucks. I know these opportunities don't come often, you know, and, and it's funny though, but like timing's everything. Like I've held on to it because if I had to start calling him that before it would, 
be weird. But that right moment and everybody's looking at him and he's unflappable. That's who he is. You know what I mean? Like it. it um, but it was funny because his family was thanking me for it. Um, and then I was like, yeah, well, Hunter probably doesn't think it's she probably would. She wanted I guess she had been telling some of the wives that she was waiting for me to give her husband a nickname because they all feel like they make the elite series and you get a nickname. Um, huh. <laughs> a lot of pressure. Um, but I was like, oh, Hunter's probably going to complain. It's not the right nickname. And she kind of did. But then she was like, no, I really like it. So hopefully he likes it. I haven't asked him or not. But uh, when you I got to go back to one question, Dave, when you call the, the winning weight, like and you're looking are the numbers I've never seen it. Are the numbers big so you can read it or do you have to like what are you looking at and how do you do you double check it to make sure you get the right like <laughs> So much could go wrong at that moment, right? <laughs> yeah, so much. Trust me. I, I think about it, um, especially after calling John Cox, John Cruz a couple of weeks ago. I thought about it more at this classic. Um, I mean, the numbers are a decent size, but I'm always leaning in because I want to make sure that like, I mean, and you want to read it right away. Like, so, you know, you, I'll study and you know, he needs this much to win. Like there's, those are small, but it'll, I'll see that what you need to win. And then you see what you got. Um, and sometimes I've actually stopped to wonder, does it actually register in my head or do I like, I feel like in some ways, if the wrong guy celebrated, I could probably announce the wrong winner. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right, right, right. You say the numbers. <laughs> I think Christie's jumping. So you're like, well, it's Christy. But if Kyle Welter had yeah. just jumped, I might <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, ha- it does happen so quick. So I don't, I don't know, but like I do, like it does, it's like real quick. Like it feels like, um, like a flash, like, like through oh, my head. Yeah. I'm like, cause I do double check it and whatever and it's happening. And <laughs> it's uh it's a weird, it's a weird job. It really is. It's, um, but it was so cool to be back to normalcy at this classic. Like it just felt like, um, normal again. And it actually felt like, <clears throat> weirdly enough the last few classics it felt like everybody was being compared to what the classic used to be like and because of mlf scheduling with the exception of i think ishman Rowe and cody myers they were the only ones from mlf that were at the classic kudos to them thank you um mm-hmm. I actually had a group of people in the expo chanting ish 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 because i heard that i heard <laughs> that um but I think it was just a weird, like, it was almost like, uh, this is bass. Like, this is bass now. Like, there was nobody comparing anything. You know what I mean? It was just like. I agree a hundred percent. Like, that is exactly like this was a final separation. Yeah. And no one was comparing anything to anything else. And, I mean, I think we talked about this. I know I did with uh, Wes and the camera guys. We went to dinner that night. We were talking about how. You know, these these younger the young guys that came in after the separ- after the initial separation, this is year four. And they, you know, a lot of them have found their niche, their character, you know, their their self-promotional values, their sponsors have settled yeah. in, their fishing style, all these things. So all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's it's like it's back to normal but better. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's it's different it's it, and it's I, and i don't think i think that whole group you know you it, it kind of bonds it's like it's like when you go through something with somebody you know what i mean like the way exactly. you and christy are bonded i think that whole group is bonded because of everything that they kind of went through but it's cool to see people like you know wes logan is getting his feet exactly. weight you know under him you look at um Caleb Summerall. Felix, Caleb Summerall, Lee Livesey, all those guys, yes. you know. Um, I thought what Austin Felix did on stage on, on Saturday was really cool. And I went up and I told him afterwards, I'm like, dude, you what may get do? some. Well, he was just real. It sucks. Huh. He didn't catch him. He caught him on day one. He didn't catch him on day two. He didn't make the cut and it sucks. And that's, and he, I hate how in this sport, everybody's like, well, get up there and smile. Well, no. When you get kicked in the nuts, you shouldn't smile. And that is a nut kicking if you've ever felt one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Especially when you catch him on day one. So he was real. And I think that that is, um, 
I think our anglers did an awesome job. Like I had a big chat with them at, you know, the um, stage walkthrough thing that we do with them. And I just kind of said, let's put on a show. Like they, I get it. You have sponsors to promote, but let's get put on a show. And I really feel like they did, you know, I think there was so many like cool little moments that happened throughout. I think Justin Hamner had a big week, you know, there were so many of those anglers that are just really coming into their own. And it, I think, it was, I think it was great. I think it was great. I mean, it, um, it's a great brand. It's a great family to be a part of. And we've said this every single, you know, podcast we've done, the three that we've done now, it's just a great family to be a part of. And the confidence level there now is like, like overpowering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not arrogance, just confidence that, you know, Bassmaster is king. <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> but you, yeah, especially in this podcast, you say what you want. Um, yeah. But, but um, no, and I, it, um, yeah, no, I think it was a celebration of the sport. It was a big, it was a big week and it'll be, I went to Ike's after party, which is weird for me. I never do that kind of stuff. Cause I'm always such a tr zombie, but my wife was with me and I felt like we should go do something because we didn't spend any time together. So uh, that was cool to go to an after party and see all that. Tom Foolery. I think a lot of the bass staff spent a lot of that night singing karaoke. I had sung on a <laughs> microphone all week, so I did not. Um, but there was there was a lot of um, bass staffers out karaoke on Sunday night, which, strangely enough, is a popular thing in Greenville. I did not think of it. Like on the way back from Ike's party, I passed literally three different karaoke bars. Wow. Like a, yeah, I, I, there's not that many karaoke I'm bars out. around me. Like, I'm out on karaoke. Yeah. I'm comfortable, you know, and with a mic or whatever, but not singing. Like, <laughs> I don't even, I embarrass myself singing in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was, uh, and now to Santee. We don't get much time in between the two, and I think that's going to be nuts, nuts. Um, speaking of nuts, your children have run past here My 732 son, times. I like it. It's like, fun, 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 fun. <laughs> He's trying his best to stay out, but he, and he's doing, he's doing a good job. No, it's great. I mean, he's just going back and forth. It's awesome. So what else we got? Is that it? This has been the longest Jake's take ever with this 20 minute segment turned into two hours, but I wow. think it was worth it. I think it was worth it. I mean, uh, you, uh, you had a front row seat to something special and I want to congratulate you. Cause I, I know what, like, I mean, it, it isn't a win for you, but it is like, it really is like, it, it, yeah, I have nothing to do with winning the game, but being a part of it is something that I cherish because they're experiences, you know, and I think I've said this a bunch of times already on, on social media, but it came full circle for me because of, you know, what happened in 2018 with Jason Christie. And then honestly being, being intimidated by him, just, just, just like everyone else, except I don't have to fish against him, you know, to end it with a hug and a high five and that emotional outpouring of, of, of sentiments that came out. I felt like, you know, there was there, my presence, my presence, I think he felt my presence and I was super high energy the whole time, just trying to stay positive. If he was this time, I wasn't quiet when he was spinning out like it, or, or what may have looked like when he was spinning yeah. out in his two minute drill. Um, I wasn't quiet this time. I was like, come on, man, you know, go get another one. Like, let's go wherever you're going to go, go get another one. And I, and I think I, you know, I guess we'll be, you know, we'll, if nothing else, we'll share that moment or that this entire weekend. And for me to go, wire to wire with him was pretty special because I got to live every moment that he did on the water. And that guy is a freaking hammer. Let me tell you. No, <laughs> we he all really know is. that. Yeah. He's a hammer. He is. And I think he's going to be even better now. Like I really think that I agree. moving forward, he's going to be even, you know, like just remember this now, Jason Christie for the rest of the elite series season doesn't have to give a crap about AOI points. Like he will, He'll, you know what I mean? But I don't think he's going to fish tournaments like that. I think he's going, he's in the classic. He's, he's, he likes to win. I mean, he's good exactly. at it. And exactly. Um, I think we're going to see a very, very destructive Jason Christie moving I, forward. 
Cause I agree. I totally agree. And he inspired his story, inspired a lot of people, a lot of other anglers. I mean, I got, I got DMS and private messages on social media from people that are young, young people that, that, you know, we're following closely talking about, man, that must have felt so good for him to be on stage to finally win the classic. I really hope, you know, that's me one day or, or whatever. I mean, yeah. he inspired a ton of people. So yeah. congratulations, Jason. That was, that was incredible. Yeah. We're going to have him on the podcast. And uh, I'm sure. I sent him, I sent him a thing. It said, dude, I know you're getting destroyed by every podcast in the world. See, it's a problem with me and podcasting, Jake. I, I, I'm too close to people. So I really don't <laughs> want to put the hell in their life. Like I did it last year with, with Cherry. And I, and I, after, I still felt bad. I'm like, look how tired he is. He, I don't want to have him. So he'll come on the podcast here. I told him whenever he has time, let me know. It'll probably be sometime in the next few weeks, but I, I'm not going to rush out there and, and hammer him because he's getting hammered by every media source out there. And, uh, and so he should, because he's the Bassmaster Classic champion. And we're the only ones that have this kind of access to Jake's take. <laughs> uh, well, at least today. How many podcasts are you doing today, Jake? This is it. <laughs> oh, I was, I was ready for you to be like, oh, I'm booked on everything. I have a whole junket. They're coming to see me in a hotel. When, um, when, when Ch Hank Cherry won it last year, I remember talking to Emily, who was keeping up with all of his, his bookings and his, yeah. you know, being his administrator for his scheduling for, for interviews and podcasts and writer calls and f photo sessions, all that stuff. And I remember like a week after he won – the, the classic he was booked through September after that through set. So Jason Christie, you might want to, you might want to hit him up today. <laughs> no, no. Honestly, well, we had him on like a month ago or whatever. Right. And, um, I just, he'll, he'll do it. He'll do it when it's time. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I have no doubt in my mind that if I'd have said, Hey, Christy, I need you for today's podcast. He would have made it happen. But, um, there's a lot of other people saying that. So I'll let them do stuff with them. And then, uh, then I'll dig deep into the nuggets that you, I don't know, <laughs> whatever he'll be on here sometime. And so will some other guy, but Jake's take is my favorite part of this show. And I thank you for making it so long. <laughs> <laughs> thank no, you I, know, I mean, I mean that. that is, wow. That didn't sound right at all. Did it? I some, see, sometimes I don't say things right. I walked up to Tiffany Paul the other <laughs> Uh -uh. I shouldn't tell this. And I was like, see, it's not easy being fat. And my wife looked at me as like, how could you have said that? I said, I didn't mean that she's fat. I mean, I am. And she is a belly because she's having a baby. But some of the stuff that comes out of my mouth is wrong. And I probably shouldn't have said that either. But we'll mop uh, that up with good luck, Tiffany. I actually, uh, she, she sent me a, uh, DM on Instagram this morning and I, and they're flying back to Idaho for a doctor's appointment tomorrow yeah. for a checkup on the baby. It's, I mean, they're getting really close, like within a week or two. Um, yeah, so, Pickwick, it's, it's like, when's the Pickwick tournament? That's when the babies like, do. So like April 1st or something or like the first part of April, April 4th, I think no. is Pickwick. Is that right? No, isn't that, uh, don't we have chick? When's chick? Doesn't matter. This isn't I'm entertaining to anybody. Us trying to. All I know out. is Santi Cooper's next. <laughs> That's yes, all I know. <laughs> it is next, yeah. and um, I, I hope to have you on after. But I kind of just hope you're just with the winner on the final day, because <laughs> <laughs> I don't these know. Are exhausting. These are exhausting. I mean, these are. This is going. It's rare to go wire to wire with anyone. Yeah. And now in three events, I've just gotten lucky enough to be with two winners wire to wire with John Cruz at St. John's. And then now Christy here, what happened at the Harris chain? Why did, how'd you screw up the Harris chain? You could have been undefeated this know. season. I blew it. I blew it there. I choked. <laughs> Jake's record so far is two and one strong two and put, one. Yeah, that's right. Two and one, two and for one. this season. That's strong. And two the classic. One. That's my first classic oh. to, to film a winner of the classic. That was the first time I'd ever done that. So in, in actuality in a camera guy and a cameraman's career, that's a pretty, I mean, that's a, that's a, a milestone or a highlight for yeah. me in a, in a camera guy career for whatever that's worth. <laughs> no, no. But I, and I totally get it. Like I, I, 
there's certain people you just want to announce a win too. Like it would, it'll, it would bum me not to have announced certain wins. You know what I mean? Like right. it drove me crazy when I couldn't be where Lee Livesey won last, you know, right. on fork. I mean, right. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like he's going to break the all time five fish record. I've done this for 12 years or whatever. And Hank's filled in for three days and he's going to get to announce. <laughs> but luckily Lee didn't totally break it, but the third biggest bag is pretty good. And, um, yeah, so let's end this because um, I've had seven um, lozenges while we did this <laughs> podcast. Woo. Um, I only have two lozenges left, so we better stop wow. talking. <laughs> That's well, what thank like. you, Dave. That was, that, that was truly a great experience. And one of the first things I thought of at the end was, man, I cannot wait to talk to Mercer. So thank you for having me here and allowing me to share my experience with everybody. All right, that has been Jake's Take. We need to get a theme song. Jake's Take, Jake's Take, <laughs> better than anyone's. Okay, I get it. That was a long one. Um, I know we call this a podcast, but it really is just conversations, me talking to a friend about uh, something I love. And some conversations are longer than others, but I can guarantee you, you learned and heard things here that you have not heard anywhere else. And uh, in some ways, maybe me and Jake talked too much, but hopefully you enjoyed it. Speaking of enjoying it, the Bassmaster Classic was awesome. I want to thank everybody who tuned in and everybody that was there. I was blown away about the amount of people that would just come up and um, mention this show or mention the call. I mean, I'd just be rolling up to takeoff and somebody would come rolling up and put their window down and be like, Humpers in the house. I mean, you have no idea how much that means to me. And I was totally blown away by the call love. I mean, we had done the show for a week at that point, and both me and Panger had mentioned to each other, we'd be walking across the expo or something, and you'd just hear somebody yell, keep or call. or It was just awesome. You guys, it means the world to me, and it means the world to Panger and, uh, and to Jake. Um, you guys have been awesome. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the extended Jake's Take and um, it's a long one. Maybe you broke it up into two, three, or four four pieces. I don't know. But um, it was long, and I've talked long enough. Check out The Call. I do it every Monday at 6 a.m. with Matt Pangrak from Bass Talk Live. We take a hot topic in bass fishing. This week's show is about kids weighing in on the Bassmaster stage with their parents who are Elite Series pros. Keep it or call it. You let me know when you watch the show. Humpers, we will see you next week. This has been the extended Jake's Take. The little show that could. It was supposed to be 20 minutes, two hours. I mean, it's just one digit off. See you next time. Enjoy being. Have a great week. And Uncle Bob, it was good seeing you this week. Take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?